In the last video, we mentioned, in passing, that Bob Maher and John Finkel got to design cards in their likeness, which invites the question, why did they get to do that? And the answer is because they won an invitational. Strap in, it's another deep dive on stuff that happened 20 years ago. Hit it! Way before Magic Arena existed, the original Magic Invitational brought a handful of the game's most popular players to compete in a tournament featuring some wacky formats. The prize? You got to help design a Magic card, and that Magic card's art would feature your likeness, which is the sickest prize ever. Money comes and goes, but your face on a wizard square? That is forever. Just ask Darwin Castle. After winning the Invitational in Rio de Janeiro in 1988, he submitted this little number his interpretation of what a red Necrotal would look like. The design team pushed back on the name on the basis that an avalanche invokes snow and thus would dictate a specific setting for the card. Castle pushed back because snow is not a hard and fast prerequisite for an avalanche. Castle won out and in 1999, Avalanche Riders was born. To earn the privilege of seeing his design and likeness in print, Darwin Castle had to win an invitational that consisted of five formats, duplicate sealed, Solomon Draft, Standard, New York Style Extended, and Mystery Constructed. There's lots of weird stuff to unpack here, so let's dive in. First, Duplicate Sealed. It's exactly what it sounds like. Everyone gets the same sealed pool and plays their decks against each other. Next up, Solomon Draft, which in hindsight is almost certainly the inspiration for the text box on Factor Fiction. It's a two-player limited variant where you open up six boosters and shuffle the cards together. Taking turns, one player reveals the top 8 cards of the stack and splits them out into face-up piles. Piles can be distributed whichever way, it doesn't really matter. Once player A is done making the piles, player B selects a pile, player A gets the other one, and then the rolls flip, and both players keep going back and forth till there are no more cards left. You build the deck out of the cards you take, and play it against your opponent. New York Style Extended <laughs> What do any of these words mean? Well, no one. I will tell you. As you might remember from last time, Extended is a defunct format that used to fulfill a similar role to the one Modern does today, but unlike Modern, Extended did rotate. It just rotated very slowly. The New York style wrinkle is a reference to the very first Pro Tour, held in New York. Pro Tour 1 in New York was standard, consisting of five sets. Fourth Edition, Chronicles, Fallen Empires, Ice Age, and Homelands. These sets are horrendous, so to make sure they all got some screen time, Pro Tour New York enforced a special rule. Each decklist needed to contain at least five cards from each set. The top eight competitors found some creative ways around this rule. If you're aware of the relative quality of these five sets, then it won't come as a huge surprise that 4th edition and Ice Age cards are overrepresented across the top eight decks. And it also won't surprise you that cards from the other three sets were generally treated like radioactive waste. Sorry, that was a wide tangent. What the hell were we talking about? Oh, oh, right, 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 okay. New York style extended. So, yeah, that's what New York style means. You have to have a minimum of five cards from each set. Let's keep moving. Rounding out the action, Mystery Constructed was just standard minus fifth edition and plus the Vanguard cards. These oversized cards depicted classic characters from Magic's lore. So how these weirdos work is they live in the command zone, but they aren't cards so you can't cast them, but what they do accomplish is that they modify your starting and maximum hand size as well as your life total. And they each come with some sort of ability. So for example, with Takara, you could hypothetically play a bunch of cheap creatures, sack them all to Takara's ability, cast Living Death to get them back, and then do it again. The reason I say hypothetically is that we don't have any deck lists from this tournament, which is gonna be a recurring theme. So Darwin Castle wins the Invitational, and a year later, everyone's opening Avalanche Riders and Urza's Legacy boosters. The entire Urza block is famously powerful, but despite that, Castle's Little Red Necrotal put in some work, most notably notching top 8 finishes in back-to-back -back world championships. Not too shabby for a 2-2 two -two for 4. The next Invitational, in 1999, was won by this guy. Okay, the diplomatic way to put this is that Mike Long is a polarizing figure in Magic's history. My response to that is to say that you can't be polarizing if everyone dislikes you because you can't stop cheating and you like to use Magic tournaments as your own staging grounds for a one-sided debate on moral relativism. Mike Long's cheating is well documented, so I'm not going to Google his name for you, but what I can do is discuss his positive contribution to Magic. 
Mike Long created the first ever combo deck back in 1997 and won Pro Tour Paris with it. As far as deck design goes, it's miles ahead of its time. Once the deck had Cadaverous Bloom and squandered resources in play, winning was pretty straightforward. Okay, sacrifice all your lands to squandered resources, cast Natural Balance, sacrifice those lands, cast Prosperity, pitch most of the cards to the Cadaverous Bloom, cast another Prosperity, and just keep moving cardboard around so you have a big old drain life to throw at your opponent. This deck seems really obvious in hindsight, but it was one of the first, if not the first, that totally eschewed any premise of interacting with an opponent in favor of simply winning the game, which it didn't do by attacking with creatures or slowly suffocating opponents with prison cards. It just made a bunch of mana, drew a bunch of cards, made even more mana, drew even more cards, and eventually converted that pattern into an enormous game-winning drain life. Mike Long designed this deck for a block-constructed Pro Tour, meaning that this groundbreaking design only drew from two sets, Mirage and Visions. Between this deck and all the subsequent cheating, the impression Mike Long left on Magic is hard to overstate. His Invitational card might be his least known contribution. Luckily, the next winner is infinitely more likable. This was overheard in an RPTQ, so take it with a grain of salt. But apparently with Meddling Mage, Chris Pakula was trying to recreate the gameplay experience of Spike Tail Hatchling. Which you can tell I didn't make up because the idea of Chris Pakula, a borderline Hall of Famer, choosing this moment to emulate the gameplay of a card from Prophecy is extremely depressing. Luckily for Chris Pakula, Meddling Mage is way sweeter than Spike Tail Hatchling, let alone the card he originally submitted. The structure of this Invitational should look mostly familiar by now, but if you don't know what Block Party is, well, you've come to the right place. Okay, so at this point there are five blocks of magic sets. The idea behind Block Constructed is that each player only gets to play with cards from that block. So each block's like a smaller version of Standard with its own ban list. The twist of Block Party is that players get to bring whatever block they want to the table. Your Tempest block deck could play against, say, an Urza block deck. This is cooler in theory than it is in practice, so let's just move on. Of all the cards we're going to cover, Meddling Mage might just have the most impressive tournament pedigree of all of them. Less than a month after Plane Shift hit, Meddling Mage featured in a Pro Tour winning deck dubbed The Solution by Hall of Famer V. Mauschewitz. Meddling Mage was in plane shift alongside Flame Tongue Kavu, the latter of which saw more play and more decks than any other card in plane shift during its time in standard. Pro Tour Tokyo was Invasion Block Constructed, which at the time was only two sets, Invasion and Plane Shift. In this context, FTK was a defining card, so everybody set to work figuring out how best to position it. Everybody but this guy. Everyone knew red was the best color in the format going in, and Zvi built his white-blue deck accordingly. Main deck Galena's Knight, main deck Crimson Acolyte. This deck won a pro tour. This is what we in the biz call a hard read, and it paid off. We're not done talking about Meddling Mage, though. Fast forward three years and Chris Pakula is still doing work, this time in Affinity. Affinity hadn't been totally banned out of standard yet, but Frenchman Pierre Canale proved that the deck was too good for extended. Of all the cards in Canali's main deck, only five of them weren't from Mirrodin Block. A lone copy of City of Brass, and a full set of Meddling Mage. It top aided two more extended Pro Tours in 2007 and 2010, finally finding a permanent home in the modern Humans deck. You don't see Humans too often these days, but the deck was a force to be reckoned with for a good two year stretch, winning Mythic Championship 2 in the hands of Eli Loveman. All in all, Meddling Mage charts as one of the best invitational cards of all time, and it was followed by perhaps the most overhyped invitational card of all time. One of the most decorated Magic players in history, an invitational win was the final hill John Fingal had left to conquer. And he wasn't shy about submitting an absurdly powerful card. After the foregone conclusion of Wrath of Lake Nif getting no surd, Finkel submitted Shadow Mage Infiltrator, an homage to his favorite creature, Ophidian. Shadow Mage Infiltrator might have been the second coming of Ophidian, but there was another creature in the same set, with the same mana cost, that rendered Shadow Mage Infiltrator pointless. Before busted creatures like Delver of Secrets, Stoneforge Mystic, and Tarmogoyf dominated for a decade, there was Meddling Mage, Quirion Dryad, and Psychotog. 
The most notorious Psycho Tog deck is probably the one that won Worlds in 2002. Tog also won a Pro Tour three years later, but its dominance while it was in Standard is what most boomers remember about the card. Standard had a ton of busted blue cards while Odyssey was legal. And in another universe, Shadow Mage Infiltrator could have been the creature all those cards coalesced around. But in this timeline, it wasn't. The first ever Invitational was in Hong Kong in 1997, won by future Hall of Famer Ole Rade, almost six months to the day after his Player of the Year win in 96. To give you an idea of how seriously he took this, here's the card he submitted. Nope, that is not a mistake. He literally submitted a card with no rules text. Enchant Worlds. Okay, um, they don't make Enchant Worlds anymore, but it's basically a normal enchantment for all intents and purposes. But it's enchanting um, the world, I suppose? And in the rules of magic, the world can't be enchanted by more than one thing. So when an enchant world enters the battlefield, the oldest enchant world falls off. So this card basically reads, destroy an enchant world for one red mana, which sucks anyway. But when this was submitted, enchant worlds were more or less done. The last ones were in visions. This is what trolling looked like in the 90s. But Rade wasn't done. When World of Bums was predictably shut down, he submitted this, which is dumb. And that's where Wizards of the Coast left it until early 2001. At this point, Darwin Castle's Invitational card top aided Worlds, and Chris Pakula's won a Pro Tour. I think it would have been tough for Ole Roddy to see these cards out in the world with real people's faces in the yard kicking so much ass and not want one for himself. So he submitted a more realistic design inspired by Quirion Ranger that eventually became this. By this point, Ole Rade had shaved his head, but Mark Rosewater insisted on depicting Rade with the long hair he sported when he won Pro Tour Columbus back in 96. Even the flavor text alludes to his nickname from back in the day, the Little Viking. By the way, that thing that Sylvan Safekeeper's riding? That's a giant trapdoor spider, one of the creatures in Rade's Pro Tour winning deck. I wouldn't call giant trapdoor spider a key creature in the deck, but it's, uh, it's definitely a creature in there. As for Sylvan Safekeeper, today it sees fringe play in Legacy and that's about it, which is more than can be said for the next card. For the 2000 Invitational in Cape Town, the formats were Standard, Duplicate Sealed, Five Color, Rotisserie Draft, and Auction of the People. That's three new formats introduced, so let's cover those. First, Rotisserie Draft. If you're familiar with fantasy sports, you're going to recognize Rotisserie Draft. Alright, imagine a table. Now imagine that table, but with one of every card from Odyssey on it. Now imagine eight people drafting it. In fantasy sports, all the players are face up. Everyone knows what everyone's got, and that information influences all future picks. Rotisserie draft works the same way. For example, Olivier Ruel first picked Abishan Cephalid Emperor. Everyone saw it. Next up, Scott Johns took Kamal Pit Fighter. Then Kibler took Shower of Coals. Suyoshi Fujita took Beast Attack. Chris Pakula took Stalking Bloodsucker, Chris Benefell took Persuasion, Kai Bude took Cabal Patriarch, and Tom Vandalo took Overrun. But Tom's the wheel, so he gets to pick again, and this time he took Call of the Herd. And on and on it goes till each player has 30 cards. It's pretty sweet. You should try it. And if you don't want to scrounge for one copy of every card for a set, I recommend TCG Player. TCGplayer.com, where a kid can be a kid. Auction of the People is another sweet one to do with friends. All right, so for 16 people, you have 17 decks and they usually share some sort of theme. So first up is the Hamarids deck. Kai Bude starts the bidding. He can bid using his starting life total and the amount of cards he'll get in his opening hand. In this case, he opens the bidding at seven cards, 20 life, because it's Hamarids, so the deck probably sucks and he doesn't want to play with it at all. That's fair. Dan Clegg and Scott Richards don't even bother bidding, so now the action's on Camille Cornelison, who bids 719. Benefell brings it down to 718, Mikey P to 717, Gary Wise to 716, Pakula to 715, Tom passes, Finkel goes to 714, Fujita passes, Scott Johns goes to 713, and then Olivier Ruel hits the gas pedal and bids down to 620. Dave Price and Antoine Ruel are rightfully scared off, and the action falls to Brian Kibler, who bids 619. Since a Hamarid deck with a six card opener is for lunatics, everyone passes on the action till it comes back to John Finkel, who bids 618. Action to Olivier, 617. Kibler, 616. Now it's getting ugly. Finkel comes back with 615 for a deck containing four copies of Viscerid Drone. 
Kibler comes back with 614 and Finkel's gone. Did Olivier Ruel bid Homerids down to six cards because he actually wanted to play the deck? Maybe. Or maybe he was banking on the assumption that someone would be nuts enough to take it off his hands. It's a bold gambit. Bid too passively and you might inadvertently stick yourself with one of the bad decks. On the other hand, if you bid too aggressively and no one follows you down the rabbit hole, you might also be stuck with a deck that was once good, but is now kind of terrible. Auction of the People is sweet, and again, if you want to recreate this experience for yourselves, might I recommend TradingCardGamePlayer.com? TCGPlayer.com. When you're here, you're family. Last format's five color, which is dumb, but I'm duty bound to cover it. You play a 250 card deck with vintage legality rules in place except anti cards are legal. The games are decided by the player that wins the largest dollar amount in anti. Cool. Whatever. Kai Bude won the tournament, and here's what he submitted. This card's kind of cool, but his card was going to be printed in Onslaught, a set with a heavy tribal creature theme. So we got this instead. Unlike Rootwater Thief or Shadow Mage Infiltrator, Void Mage Prodigy never came close to convincing anyone it was any good. On top of that, the artwork was deemed so unflattering that Wizards of the Coast commissioned a promo version that ended up being even fatter. This card is a crime. Let's move on. 11 players won invitationals and were immortalized on cards. Six of them are in the Hall of Fame. In terms of lifetime pro points, our next invitational winner brings up the rear. Say hello to Solemn Simulacrum. So far, there have been a lot of instances where R&D has actually made the submitted card better, and Solemn Simulacrum is no exception. Because Thorin's card was set to appear in the artifact-centric plane of Mirrodin, his forest folk was changed to an artifact, and Mr. S was born. You most likely know all about Solemn Simulacrum from Commander, but the sad robot helped propel four decks to Pro Tour Top 8s over a span of almost 10 years, and three of those decks won their Pro Tour. For Yenz's Invitational, the five formats were Standard, Online Extended, which only went back to Invasion at that point, Auction of the People, Two-Headed Giant Sealed, and Rochester Draft. The rules of Two-Headed Giant have varied widely over the past 20 years, but the format distills down to this. You and a teammate share a life total in turns, but not a deck. You are literally a giant with two heads squaring off against another two-headed giant in magic. It's all right. Rochester draft's a thing they don't really do anymore, mostly because it takes forever. Basically, it's a rotisserie draft. Each player has three packs, opens them one at a time, gets the first pick, and then whoever gets the eighth pick is the wheel. You do this 24 times, it is interminable. But we're going at a pretty good clip here, so let's keep moving. The next Invitational was in 2004, and the formats were Online Extended, Mirrodin Block Constructed, which at the time was only Mirrodin and Darksteel, Auction of the People, Rochester Draft, and something called Pack Draft, which is Rochester Draft but with five packs and all 16 people. The packs ranged from Invasion to Darksteel. That draft probably took 12 years. If this isn't your first rodeo on the old trading card game player YouTubes, the winner of the 2004 Invitational is going to look pretty familiar. Bob Maher's original submission was virtually guaranteed to never see print. By his own admission, Mark Rosewater is the one we can thank for Dark Confidant. It's a sweet card, and its tournament pedigree is proof. For a large chunk of its existence, Dark Confidant was largely associated with the modern iteration of Jund, as seen here in a runner-up finish at Pro Tour Return to Ravnica. But Dark Confidant notched Pro Tour Top 8s before and after that. Pro Tour Honolulu, Pro Tour Charleston, Pro Tour Valencia, and Pro Tour Rivals of Ixalan. Five Pro Tour Top 8s with three wins. Greatness at any cost, indeed. We've had a pretty good little stretch of cards here, haven't we? Well, I take no pleasure in announcing that that streak is over. This is, by my estimation, the worst invitational card of the bunch narrowly edging out Rootwater Thief. This one's got a lot of text, so let's break it down. You can tap it to immediately thought seize yourself, at which point you then get to thought seize your opponent. God forbid anyone ever has to cast this card, let alone activate it, but just for completion's sake, let's go through it. Once the ability resolves, you're both playing with your hands face up, you're both down your best card, and your creature is tapped. And if I'm being honest, I love when my creature with first strike has a tap ability, because what better way to leverage that keyword ability than to completely remove it from combat, am I right? At this point you're probably thinking, wow, this card seems not very good, I bet the original submission was awesome and they powered it down. 
Uh, nope, the original submission wasn't much better. But Rakdos Augur Mage wasn't the only Invitational card to come out of the 2005 Invitational. In the very next set, we were introduced to Gemstone Caverns, which was inspired by Suyoshi Fujita's submission, Unlucky Man's Paradise. Alright, so for this Invitational, everybody submitted a card, and voters in a 2005 poll got to decide which additional card would see print. In a landslide, Unlucky Man's Paradise won. Fujita himself is nowhere to be found on the card, that privilege is for closers, but his concept inspired a particularly busted card. Gemstone Caverns is nowhere near as good as Unlucky Man's Paradise and it's still way out of bounds. Coincidentally, this was the last time the voting public got to ship an additional invitational design to the printing press, but it was fun while it lasted. Next stop, E3 2006 in Los Angeles. I'll say it right at the top of this one. Jeff Cunningham wrote a three-part tournament report for this tournament that is widely considered the best tournament report of all time. I say this because it's pointless to try and recap that tournament when Jeff's account already exists. If you Google Jeff Cunningham get big or die trying, you'll probably find it. You might need to use the Wayback Machine, but trust me, it's gonna be worth it. At this point, you may be wondering, did Jeff Cunningham win the tournament? No. No, he did not. Antoine Ruel won. And here's the card he submitted, which sucks. And here's what it became. Ranger of Eos is actually a pretty sweet card with a lengthy Pro Tour resume. In this deck, it could go get Burnt and Forge Tender, or Figure of Destiny. I don't want to think about how desperate you'd have to be to grab a gold medal stalwart. In this deck, it could grab Figure of Destiny, Mog Fanatic, or Flamekin Harbinger for Revelark. In this deck, it could grab Scoop Mob, Wild Nicotle, or even Noble Hierarch in a pinch. In this deck, which by the way marks the second Pro Tour where Ranger of Eos deck won the whole shebang, it could grab Figure of Destiny, Student of Warfare, or Step Links. Here's where it gets gnarly. In Jacob Wilson's runner-up deck at Pro Tour Born of the Gods, Ranger of Eos could grab Birds of Paradise, Noble Hierarch, and the best get of all, Viscera Seer, which is an infinite combo with Malira and Murderous Redcap. You stack the red cap to Viscera Seer, deal two to their face, persist triggers, but the creature didn't get the counter because of Malira. So, you get to keep doing it until they die. Neat. We're almost at the end, and in the tradition of Vanessa Williams, we save the best for last. The winner of the last ever Invitational was Tiago Chan, who originally submitted this thing that's either insanely busted or completely unplayable with no in-between. Luckily, Reason and Snapcaster Mage prevailed. Despite being the Invitational card that spent the least time in players' hands, Snapcaster Mage's versatility allowed it to notch a staggering eight Pro Tour top eights, not to mention a slew of GP results. All of these decks are blue mid-range soup. Even the Splinter Twin deck is a combo deck nested in a mid-range deck. And Snapcaster Mage was the glue that held them all together. Whew, that's it. Now that you've made it to the end of this latest little nugget of content from your friends at TCG Player, here's what you can do to ensure we can keep making more of these things. First, like the video and subscribe to the channel. That's pretty basic algorithm gaming stuff, but we're not done yet. Next, drop a comment. As I'm reading this, I'm wearing a Rhystic Studies hoodie and it's dope as hell and I'm incredibly jealous. So, if you made it this far, type I want merch in the comments, preferably in all caps, so my boss knows that you mean business. The TCG Player link in the description gives us credit for the sale, so please use that the next time you buy cards. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.